right, good morning, church. Let's get up on our feet. Let's get our hands going just like this. We're going to sing Marvelous Light. And I invite you to sing this one with me if you know it. Let's sing this out. Ooh. Well, into marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the light, you are the way Into marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth
Are you guys ready to worship this morning? Hey, tell me, is he good? Tell me, is he God? He is church online this is our time of communion where we come together to remember Christ's sacrifice that was made for us 
The cup you were given has two wrappers. One wrapper holds the bread and one wrapper holds the juice. And when you're done, you can place the empty cup on the back of the chair in front of you. I read something the other day that said, practice the pause. And that's what I want us to do today. The post was made by WCIC and it said, when in doubt, pause. When you're tired, pause. When angry, pause. When stressed, pause. Let me add to this, when you're sad, discouraged, happy, worried, heartbroken, thankful, whatever you are feeling, make the time to pause. The post went on to say, and when you pause, pray. And again, let me add to this, when you pray, thank the Lord, because he is good and his love endures forever. I don't know what you're feeling right now, what's going on in your life, or what you're carrying with you today. But whatever it is, as we enter into this holy week and we enter into this time of worship through communion, practice the pause and repeat the reminder, cling to the promise that he is good and his love is forever. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time where we get to remember you, remember you and your gift. I don't know what everyone is feeling today, Father, but I know that you have a plan. And we cling to that promise that you are good and your love endures forever. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is our time of worship through offering. It's a time when we have the opportunity to give back to God. The Bible says, freely you have received, freely you give. You can give of your offering as you leave today, but right now I just wanna invite you to spend time in worship of the many gifts that we have been blessed with, remembering again that God is good and his love endures forever. Now if you guys will get on your feet, Perry is on keys today, and he is playing one of my very favorite songs. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Say, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Hey, I was, thinking, I was thinking about that little that little line that I say all the time, and, and you guys are always so great with responding. But I was thinking as I was preparing for this week, the week before Easter, um, man, you know, how can we, how can I encourage our people to invite people? See, the thing is, um, next week is Easter, and today you may be glad to be in the house of the Lord, but there's lots and lots of people that you know that are not in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, so I want to encourage you as we sing this song um, by Cochran and Company. It's called Church Take Me Back uh, because uh, sometimes people just need an invite to come back to church. And uh, I hope you will invite somebody. Easter is a time when people will come. If you, if you invite them, uh, they'll come on Easter because it's a special day. So let's all sing this, and I just encourage you, invite somebody to come to Easter next week. There was a time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had. I was running, I was searching, but every place I looked for healing left me broken like a lass. Come on, sing it. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church yeah. Tried to walk on my own, but I wound up lost hey. Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross
people I can depend on to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse.
to dedicate six awesome kids to our church family. Because dedication here at 1C is all about partnering with these families, we wanted to share this moment with you. The parents and families took a vow to do everything in their power to raise their children in a Christ-centered home. Do you dedicate your child to the Lord, knowing that they are a gift from Him? Do you promise to set a Christian example before your child do you pledge to do all you can to direct your child towards a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as a Savior? And we, as a church, are taking a vow to support them in this mission and doing everything we can to help them raise their children with Christ. We would like to give this family all of our blessings and you want to say something? Amen. We love seeing parents make that commitment to raising their kids in a Christ-centered home. It is so neat to see. You know, before we dive in today, I just want to remind you with Easter being next week about the vision of our church. We are on a mission to reach the one. And the one is someone who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And back in January, what we did is we each identified our one and we placed a sticker with either their name or their initials on that giant map out in our lobby. And I shared with you in week one of this series that there is an 82% chance that somebody will attend Easter services if they're invited by somebody that they have a personal relationship with. It's so like Perry just said earlier, this is the week to invite. Be praying for your one. And if you've not already identified your one, I want to encourage you after this service is over to do so. Write their name down on a sticker, place it on that map out in the lobby, because we're going to have a team of people who are going to be praying over those names this week. And if you'll do your part by inviting, I can promise you that the church staff and the volunteers, they will do our, we will do our part to be prepared and to be ready to make sure that your one comes into an environment where they can experience the hope that Jesus Christ has to offer but for the past four weeks, we have been studying out of the book of Genesis. And whenever sin entered into our world, it threw everything out of whack. And we've been specifically looking at the consequences that resulted from sin. Because of sin, something was going to have to be done to reverse this curse that we've all been living under. We, we know that the things that we experience in life, they're not the way that things are supposed to be. And since the system was broken, whenever Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden, something was going to have to be done. Something was going to have to be done to fix everything. And that's where Jesus comes into the picture. And Jesus, he was born to a virgin in a little town by the name of Bethlehem. And his birth was going to be the start of a great rescue mission. For 30 years, he, he walked around the earth learning and doing many of the things that you and I do on a daily basis. But then at the age of 30, he began his public ministry and our world started to see a hope that they had never seen before. The blind had their sight restored. The lame could walk again. The deaf could hear. There was thousands of people that were fed with just two fish and five loaves of bread. There was even people that were being brought back from the dead. And so Jesus and his ministry, it took people by surprise, but, but not everybody liked the things that he was doing. And today is a day that is known as Palm Sunday. On the final week of his life, Jesus, he was riding on the back of a donkey into Jerusalem. And there was this huge crowd that had gathered alongside of the road to, to see him. And they cut down palm branches. And they took their garments. They spread it out over the road as Jesus passed by. And so that's where we get this name Palm Sunday. But that final week of Jesus' life was a week that was full of events. But our God, he never stopped working. He cleared out the temple. He shared a final meal with his disciples. He prayed in the, the Garden of Gethsemane until he was betrayed by Judas and was arrested. He would go through six trials and then ultimately he would give up his life on the cross. 
And as we read through these events in the final week of Jesus, beginning in Matthew chapter 21, we just see one injustice after another. But there's always been a part of this story that has bothered me. And it's the part whenever the, the crowd, when given a choice to choose between Barabbas or Jesus, they chose to free Barabbas. Barabbas was a guy that was guilty of murder. He was a notorious prisoner. He was the guy that deserved punishment, not Jesus. And I think we are a society that loves justice. We want to see good people be rewarded. We want to see bad people pay a price. And I also believe as a society, we get annoyed or we get frustrated whenever good things seem to happen to people who, who don't deserve it. But yet that's exactly what we see with Barabbas. Whenever we think about injustice, most of us seem to think about Jesus because here's this innocent man, a man who did no wrong, but he is brutally killed. But, but what about Barabbas? What about the, the, guilty, or the guilty murderer who was set free? Now, we looked at Barabbas' story a couple of years ago whenever we were forced to do church online, but I want to look at it again today because I think this story fits so well with the series that we're in. Because what Jesus did for Barabbas, he did for us. And we really, we don't know a whole lot about Barabbas, but what we do know tells us enough that we probably wouldn't have liked the guy if we would have been alive back in those days. Because Matthew, he refers to him as a notorious prisoner. Mark says that he was a murderer and a revolutionary. John says that he was a thief. So it's obvious he's the bad guy. He's the guy that you want to see get it in the end. But by the time we meet Barabbas, Jesus is now in his sixth and final trial. He's standing before Pilate in a place that John calls the, the pavement in chapter 19. And Pilate, he's tried a number of different ways to try to get Jesus off the hook. Pilate kind of viewed Jesus as one of those no-win situations. He believed that Jesus was an innocent man, so he doesn't want to sentence him to death. And his wife had warned him that, um, in a, that she'd had a dream saying not to let Jesus' blood be on, her hand, on his hands. But then on the other hand, Pilate was also kind of afraid of the Jewish leaders. If he doesn't do what they want him to do, they could cause a riot among the Jews. And then if words to get back to Rome that Pilate's unable to control the people... Well, then he runs the risk of getting in trouble. And so Pilate, he decides that he's going to try a few different things. And so the first thing that he does is he says, you know what? Jesus is from Galilee and Herod, he's the ruler over Galilee. So this is really his jurisdiction. This is really his problem. So I'm going to send Jesus to Herod. So Jesus, he's sent to Herod. And Herod has heard that Jesus has the ability to perform miracles. So whenever Jesus arrives, he wants to see one. Now, he, he wants to see one not because he believes in the power of Jesus. He simply just wants to see something neat. But Jesus isn't interested. In fact, he doesn't even speak a word to Herod. And so Herod quickly, he, he gets bored with Jesus and sends him right back to Pilate. And so idea number one doesn't work. And so here's the next thing that he does. He says, well, you know, maybe instead of killing him, people would settle down if I just have him beaten really badly. And so he orders for Jesus to be whipped. And the Roman soldiers, they would get a whip that had these metal balls and these broken pieces of bone weaved into them, and then they would whip Jesus. But not just in his back, they would start on his back and they'd work all the way down his legs. And these metal balls, they would hit the skin and they would cause bruising. And the bruising would get deeper and deeper until the skin became lighter, and that's when the soldiers would change up their technique. Now, instead of just hitting him, they would hit him, and then they would rake this, this whip down Jesus' back and the back of his legs. We know from historians that six out of ten men would die from this method. And the thought of this, every single time, every time that I mention this, it makes me sick to my stomach. I get those, those cold chills whenever I think about this. Pilate, he's going to once again bring Jesus before this angry mob and he thinks, surely this is going to be enough. Surely they're going to be good with letting him go now. But they weren't. And so let's fast forward to the sixth and the final trial of Jesus. Pilate, he's got one more card that he's going to try to play. In Matthew chapter 27, the Bible tells us it was around this time of year during the Passover that the governor, he had this custom of releasing one of the prisoners. Now, this would have been a, a custom back in this day that Pilate would have hated. But each year, what he would do is he would do this as a way to try to calm the people down. But this year, instead of seeing it as a problem, he actually saw this as a solution. He saw this as the solution to this Jesus problem that he had. And so here's what Pilate does. He thinks, he goes, 
Who could I put up against Jesus that I know the people are going to choose Jesus over the other guy? And I'm sure that Pilate had lots of different people that he could have chosen from. In fact, he could have chosen either one of the guys that died on the cross next to Jesus. But instead, he chose a guy by the name of Barabbas. Why? Well, the Bible it calls Barabbas a notorious prisoner. It says that he's well-known. Not that he's well-liked, but he's well-known. And so the people would have known who Barabbas was. Surely they wouldn't want somebody like that back out on the streets. Surely they're going to choose Jesus over Barabbas. And so he comes to this angry crowd and he says, who do you want me to release to you? Let's pick up our story. Matthew chapter 27, verses 17 through 20. It says, as the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who's called the Messiah? And he knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Verse 19. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. Well, Chuck Swindoll, he points out that Barabbas, he would have been in prison in a place that's called the Fortress of Antonia. And this is where all the prisoners were kept back in ancient Jerusalem. And Jesus, he's standing before Pilate on this place that's called the Pavement. And so I, I can't help but wonder, did Barabbas know what was taking place? Because Jesus would have been about 2,000 feet away from Barabbas. So that's six and a half football fields away. And so it's too far for Barabbas to hear what Pilate's saying to the crowd, but he was close enough that he could hear what the crowd was saying back to Pilate. Let's look at Matthew 27, verses 21 through 23. It says, so the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? And the crowd shouted back, Barabbas. And Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus who's called the Messiah? And they shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Now Barabbas, he would have only been able to hear what the crowd is saying, not Pilate. So as he sits in prison, he hears Barabbas, crucify him. And so he probably thinks, oh man, they're going to kill me. And so there's just a couple of things that I want us to see from our lesson today. And the first is that Barabbas is going to get the surprise of the lifetime whenever he finds out that somebody else took his place. Somebody else took his place. And so the prison door, it slams open and there's Barabbas chained up. And they, they come over to him and I'm sure that he's thinking to himself, the minute that they take these chains off, the fight is going to be on. I'm sure that he is ready to fight for his life because he believes that he's going to be crucified. But then he hears one of the soldiers say, Barabbas, you're free. I can't even imagine all the different thoughts that had to be running through his mind. I'm sure that he's trying to let it all sink in. And then one of the soldiers really explains, no, really, you're, you're free. Somebody else is going to die on your cross. I kind of imagine Barabbas stumbling out of his jail cell, laughing at the thought of this. And then he asks, well, who? Who's going to die on my cross? And the soldier responds, well, it's, it's Jesus, the one who's called the Christ. Now, you need to know Barabbas would have known who that is. He, he had heard the stories. He knew the teaching, but yet that's where our story ends. And if it was you or if it was me that was writing this story, this is not how we'd have the story end. We would have Barabbas be this innocent family man that was wrongly sentenced and wrongly, uh, wrongly thrown into prison because that would have made Jesus even more of a hero than he was. That would have made the story way more heroic. But the Bible makes it crystal clear that that is not who Barabbas was. The gospel writers, they had to tell us, no, that this notorious thief is the one that's set free. And Barabbas, he did nothing to earn his pardon. As far as we know, he didn't even ask for it. He did nothing to receive this free gift of life. He is completely and totally undeserving. Does that sound familiar? Because it should. Next thing I want us to see today is that we all are undeserving of God's grace. We are all undeserving of God's grace. This story of Barabbas, it should sound familiar because with all of us, God has been just as reckless. He's been just as irresponsible with his love and he's been just as careless with his compassion and his grace, giving it to those who don't deserve it. And of all the characters that surround the story of the crucifixion, this is the one that we know the least about, but yet he's the one that we have the most in common with. We are all Barabbas. 
We are all that guilty person who Jesus died for. And whenever sin entered into our world back in Genesis, we were all infected. And there are consequences for our sin. We learned just last week that one of the consequences for sin is death. So unless somebody could come and pay the price for us, we were all looking at an eternity in hell. And what Jesus did for Barabbas, he did so for us to an even greater degree. Romans chapter 3, in verse 23, it says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And so in other words, we have all been found guilty. And in Romans chapter 6, in verse 23, it says, The price for that sin is death. But the Bible also tells us that God, he loved us so much that he sent Jesus down to this earth to pay for our sins. He sent Jesus down to pay the, pay the price. He sent Jesus to die on our cross. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so all we have to do is accept it. Well, let's talk about what might have happened with Barabbas because this is where our story ends. His name is never mentioned again anywhere in the Bible. And so we're kind of left to guess what might have happened with him and lots of people have tried to, to guess what he might have done with his life. Now, a few years ago, I shared some of these scenarios with you, but I want to share some of them with you again today. One scenario is that Barabbas turned himself in. They said that, that Barabbas, he was so guilty over this innocent man dying in his place that he went and he turned himself into the Roman authorities and he insisted that he pay for his crimes. He in, insisted on serving his sentence. And so it's in this scenario that Barabbas is pictured as this undeserving recipient who like a fool refuses. He's offered freedom, but instead he chooses prison. He's offered to have his chains taken off, but instead he says, no, leave him on. This is what I deserve. Do you know anybody that responds to God's grace this way? They say, oh, I could, I could never accept a gift like that. I think there just seems to be some people out there who refuse God's great gift because it just seems too good to be true. We're all taught that there's nothing free in life, so this free gift of salvation, it just seems too good to be true. But Jesus, he's purchased this incredible gift for us, and he's patiently waiting for each one of us to just simply accept it. And maybe something's happened and maybe God's got your attention for the first time in a really long time. Maybe it's the things that are happening in our world right now, like the war in Ukraine or, or the, the pandemic that we're just getting over. But maybe we've all just received that wake-up call that we so desperately needed and God, he's patiently waiting for us to accept this free gift. But many people foolishly, however, they refuse it. Maybe that's what Barabbas did. Another scenario is that Barabbas stayed the same. That he didn't change at all, that he went out and he just committed even more murders. That he went right back to his old way of life. And we know that happens. We've seen that happen with people before. But when you receive such undeserved grace, how can you not let that change your life? Still some people who've heard the stories ever since they were kids. People who are fully aware of the sacrifice that was made for them. They go right back to their old life and they act like nothing even happened. And I wonder, maybe did Barabbas start off well? You know, did he start off determined to live a good life, but before long he just was right back to his old ways? Maybe that's what's happened to some of you. You come to church on the weekend and you think, you know what, things are going to change. I'm going to make some changes in my life, but it's not too long before we're right back to business as usual. One of the reasons that we take communion in our worship services on a weekly basis is because we need to be reminded of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. That way we'll continually to reflect the gift that we've all received. Well, the third scenario that I want to share with you is that Barabbas, he, he tried to earn his grace. He went out there and he, he tried to, to earn it. After he received this incredible gift, he, he says, you know what? If I can just be good enough, if I can do just enough good, then maybe, just maybe, I'll be able to repay God for what he's done for me. And so Barabbas, he's pictured as this undeserving person who says, no, I'm not going to take a handout. No, I'm going to earn this myself. And I know people who respond to God's grace the exact same way. You're out there and you're trying to earn it. But in Titus chapter 3, in verse 5, it says, He saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. Every other world religion out there, it says you've got to earn this. That you've got to work for it. 
That you got to be good enough. And if you do enough good things, if you, if you pray five times a day, or if you fast, or if you don't eat certain foods, or if you observe the, fa- or the Sabbath, if then, if you do all those things, maybe on the day that you meet Jesus Christ face to face, maybe God will let you into heaven. But Romans 3.24 says, Yet God in his grace, he freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. We are not saved by our good works. Well, there's one last guess as to what might have happened to Barabbas, and that is Barabbas accepted grace. And this is the one that I hope is accurate. It describes Barabbas as this undeserving recipient who humbly accepts accepts it. And I would like to think that curiosity maybe got the best of him and that he would have wanted to see what the man looked like that, that was dying on his cross. And so as he sees Jesus carrying this cross up to Calvary, perhaps Barabbas whispered to himself, that's that's my cross. And maybe he stuck around long enough to see the Roman soldiers slamming the nails through his hands and he thought to himself, man, those, those nails, those are supposed to be mine. And I can't even imagine how difficult it would have been to watch this thing taking place. And I'm sure the natural reaction, the natural response would be to close your eyes. And as he closes his eyes, I'm sure that he could still hear the pounding of the nails going through the feet of Jesus. And I wonder if that's the point where it hits him that this man, he died in my place. Because once you see that, and once you believe that, you'll never be the same. Your response is to live this grateful and this joy-filled life. But the man who died for our freedom, he never stopped working. He said, no, I I chose this. I I volunteered for this. You don't have to pay anything at all for this. All you need to do is just humbly accept this free gift. And I don't know what happened. I'd like to think that this is the way that it played out, but we don't know and we won't know until we get to heaven. But I do know that this is how the story can go. Because right now I'm talking to a room full of Barabbases, myself included. So the last thing that I want us to see this morning is that Jesus... He died in our place. Jesus died in our place. And I think if Jesus could whisper just two words to us before he was going to breathe his last breath, the words that he would whisper is, accept this. He'd say, accept it. It's foolish to refuse it. You can't possibly earn it. There's no way that you deserve it. I just want you to accept it. But you know, all these things that we've learned in this series so far, it's not going to matter if Jesus isn't able to back up who he says he is. Because up to this point, there have been lots of people who have died on a cross before, but nobody had ever came back from the dead. And next weekend, whenever we see Jesus defeat the grave, it's all going to make sense. But if you've not accepted that free gift of salvation, make today the day. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and be baptized after this service is over, I want to encourage you to go out to our next steps area in the lobby and we've got a team of people who would love to talk to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you that you loved us enough that you sent Jesus to come and pay the price for our sins. And so as we go into this Easter season, Father, we we want to say thank you and we want to remember that sacrifice that you made for us. Father, thank you for your love. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, we are so thankful to worship with all of you today. You can continue to worship through offering by stopping by one of our giving walls, one of our giving drop boxes, or our website, 1c.church. If you're joining us for the first time today, a few things. Number one, we have a gift for you. So stop by and see us at that big next step sign out in the lobby before you leave today. Two, just for being here, our church will donate $5 to one of our missions partners. This month it is Dream Big Honduras Medical Mission. So again, stop by and see us before you leave. Three, last but not least, if you are new to the church, on Sunday, April 24th, we will have an event that we are calling First Steps in the Fellowship Hall. It's an opportunity to meet the staff and just to find out more about our church. Next week is Easter. Again, remember to clean to that promise that he is good and his love endures forever. And we'll see you next week.